Welcome to Clearing the Clutter Inside and Out with Julie Caraccio. Every Tuesday at 1 p.m., hear easy to implement tips on decluttering all areas of your life physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, and energetic. Learn how to release clutter and get organized to create the life you choose, deserve, and desire. An award winning professional organizer and coach, Julie is passionate about supporting people in clearing clutter so they can share their gifts with the world and live a more joyful and fulfilling life. Hey everyone, December's bonus is going to be a little different. My cover for clearing the clutter inside and out says clutter free for a more joyful and fulfilling life. Today I'm going to share an interview I did with someone who lived life to the fullest. This was an interview I did with Sybil Rhodes, who was like a second mother to me. She passed in January of 2014, and we did this interview in 2013. Sybil was also the only co-pilot I had when I did Reawaken Your Brilliance. Sybil led an amazing life. She grew up dirt poor and never became very wealthy, yet she traveled the world and never knew a stranger. In my eyes, Sybil led a fulfilled and joyful life. I do this show because when you release what you don't need, you can create the life you choose, deserve, and desire. Sybil never smoked a day in her life, yet developed lung cancer with a diagnosis of stage four. She lived with stage four for over 12 years. I believe that is a testament to her life, her faith, friends, and family, and her fulfillment of life. I've never met someone who embraced life as much as Sybil. Her sister told me when she died, her last words were, take me now, take me now, take me now. Leave it to Sybil to embrace death and be ready for the next adventure. I hope you gain something important from our talk and maybe perhaps discover something that you're ready to release that's cluttering your life right now. Hey, good afternoon and welcome to a special edition of Reawaken Your Brilliance. Although we are recording live, this show will not be aired until April. So I'm very excited. I'm here in Natchitoches, Louisiana and backed by popular demand is the uh, incomparable Miss Sybil Rhodes. And those of you that tune into Nissan Communication knows that you uh, that Sybil hit it out of the ballpark the other day with Marilyn's show. So we brought her back to, uh, to bring more of her wit and wisdom. So welcome, Sybil. Thank you and good af afternoon, everyone. It's a very pleasant day here in Natchez, Louisiana, which is the oldest city in the Louisiana Purchase. I want to tell you just a little bit about the day I was born. It was in July 1933, uh, which was a very bad time for the financial world. It was during the high, high days of the Depression. Anyway, my mother started her processing of me in the morning, and then they called the next door neighbor who was going to come and be my, with my mother when I was born. Uh, but in the long run, they did call and get the doctor. Actually, they didn't call him. Someone got on a horse and went to his house, and he came out, and he spent the whole day with my mother and myself until I was born. I tell you this because I think it's remarkable in 78 years that we have gone from the doctor coming to the birthing of a person and staying all day until now when we go to the hospital at the last moment. But there was one funny little incident. All the people in the community came in and out during the daytime to visit. My great-grandmother came by, and she uh, helped with the birthing process, too. Uh, I'm sure assisted the doctor. And uh, one lady went home to see about something, and then she came back, and in her excitement, she sat down in a chair and did not see that the chair had a pan of water in it. So that's lightened the whole situation of the birthing day up. That's wonderful. I like that. Now, Seb, I wanted to ask you a question. Your daddy was a sharecropper, and you have ended up leading a remarkable life. And even though your father started off as a sharecropper, he ended up being able to purchase the land that he had sharecropped on. There are a lot of people out there who believe if they're born into a certain set of circumstances, that that's where they need to remain their entire life. So what, what, what drew, drove you? Why were you able to go higher and reach beyond your means when you started or where you started in life? Well, I think simply deprivation. 
I felt like I was deprived of many things that other people have. And uh, I wanted those just like anyone else. I wanted a, more than a, a grade school uh, education. Many people in the, in the area that I lived in only went through the eighth grade and they considered they had a good, especially a man, consider that he had a very good uh, education to go through the eighth grade. I wanted a better education. I wanted, I wanted, for one of the things I wanted, my father never had a car, never had a vehicle. We never had a telephone. We, uh, and of course, for many, until I was in the eighth grade, which uh, was 13 years old, we didn't have electricity in the house. We used uh, coal oil lamps to light by. We cut our own wood to, uh, for heating. We did eventually uh, get butane for cooking, and then we pro progressed on, progressed on to having butane for heating as well though, as the wood. However, I must say we continued to like a wood stove or a fireplace. We had a fireplace, and we enjoyed that. But I think just the, uh, uh, just the push to have things that other people have uh, that might be sound a little. Uh, negative, but that's really what pushed me was because I was deprived of many things uh, and everything. But, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people who are deprived also have that drive that you do, but they become obsessive and want material goods and want to have a bunch of luxuries. Why don't you think you ever got pushed into that direction and escape that? I think I ended up getting my luxuries by pushing what I did. I, I consider that I have a very luxurious life, you know. I mean, I've been able to do much of wanting what I wanted to, but uh, I, I think I had a drive. And uh, I might give you a little example of a drive I think that I had or have. Uh, I was in Turkey once and uh, I bought a little rug. And I explained to the man, uh, I would hunt him out, down to the ends of the earth if I didn't receive it. And uh, so I didn't receive it, and I didn't receive it, and I didn't receive it. So he had given me a, a telephone number locally. Uh, well, I'm at U.S. and in, in the U.S. Uh, to call. Well, in talking to them, they seemed very distant uh, from him. And I finally I asked if they maybe had um, abandoned their relationship, and they sort of implied they had. Uh, and uh, I called my bank, and uh, I was told by somebody, uh, it was on a credit card, that uh, they could have they could have gotten the money for me, but they my local bank didn't choose to do that. So I just got so uh, provoked and aggravated that I just simply called the Turkey Embassy. In about two or three weeks, I had my money back. So I think in talking about what you can do to achieve your goals in life, I think it's persistency. Walk, sometime need. I didn't particularly need that item, but walk, need, and uh, and just the drive to achieve. Uh, I think uh, is well will get you to your goals anyway. Ready to change your life? Are you ready to release all of your clutter? physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual? Our new Declutter Your Life video series is a how-to, go-at-your-own-pace course to guide you through the process of clearing clutter. The course includes all of our popular How to Get Organized classes. Learn more at reawakenyourbrilliance.com. And I also think that there's a greater lesson here. Don't mess with civil roads or she will hunt you down. So for those of you listening, just remember that. So what would you say is your philosophy on life? What are kind of your guiding principles and values that make you get out of bed every day and that you try to do? Well, I think acceptance and love. I think if you accept a person uh, where they are, perhaps they need to change their ways. Perhaps you try to help them to change their ways and they don't change them. Uh, but you continue to accept them as another human being. Uh, this does not mean you have to take them to your bosom and be their 
bosom friend or even their friend, but you just accept that, uh, let's say somebody down the street uh, has loud noise all the time. Well, if you can't achieve that a goal with them and ceasing that, well, the best thing to do is to go ahead and just accept that that's the way it is. Uh, I just I just think acceptance is a, it, and if we accepted each other, we would have less war, and we would have less crime, and we would be happier. I totally agree with you about that. And I have to admit, when you were doing your interview with Marilyn, I cried through the first half. And so it would be my goal to keep this upbeat. But I would love to share you to share with us. This is one of the funniest stories you ever shared with me. Share your, uh, I think, this love and acceptance would have worked in this particular instance. Share the story about your mama and the naming the pig. Oh. Well, my mother was a very strong, strong person. And uh, when my father uh, was in the shipyard during the World War II, which was nearly four years, well, she, we continued to live in Upper East Texas. And so she was the man of the house as well as the mistress of the house. So she had to make many decisions. And she was also the oldest child of 12 children so responsibility was always with her. But we live in a sharecropper, in a, uh, in a sharecropping position. This was before my daddy made the money in the, uh, in the shipyard. And that's another issue that I'd like to touch on too. Uh, she, uh, she, she, we anyway, we lived in this house that belonged to the share, the, we, we, we were his sharecropper. And so they had two children, our age, and he, the mother was named Ethel. Uh, she did not like for us to, to play with her children, but we would slip off and meet the halfway in the pasture sometime and play with each other. But she really thought that we were not good enough for her. Anyway, in the meantime, from their house, to the, we went to the place that we owned. And by the, that time, Daddy uh, had made enough money to own his own place. So she bought a, a, a sow, that's a female pig, from uh, Ethel. Well, she named her Miss Ethel. Well, mm -hmm. Miss Ethel turned out to be a real jewel. She ended up having her first time 12 piglets. And needless to say, we shared little piglets and pigs to the community as well as we had a very fruitful year and uh, having uh, enough pork, which we also, you know, did ourselves. We uh, uh, smoked it and canned it and uh, used it in every way that we could. Remember, we still didn't have refrigeration at that time. Now, I did want to touch on the, uh, about the shipyard. I know that this, that our society runs in an interesting way, but through many lives being destroyed, this was how my father overcame his status as a sharecropper. In other words, we had a war. The government had to hire people to make ships and ammunition and what have you. So through all those young people that were killed or otherwise maimed and hurt, we achieved and got a place of our own. So, you know, I just want to say to, I can't say it to those veterans, but I would like to say to all veterans, my hats are off to you. And if you wondered why my father wasn't in the army, he was past, this was when they had draft days and he was past the draft age was the reason he wasn't in the service too. Unless you were uh, 4F, un unable physically, uh, you, were in a certain age, you were drafted. And as they got older, he was in the next section of being drafted if the war had not ended. But again, I want to say thank you veterans everywhere. Well, I know you had also told me that you wanted to tell another story that was one of your favorites from childhood about the time that your mother had to go get a battery for the radio and was driving a wagon. Yeah, you know, we didn't have electricity, so we didn't have a radio, which was uh, pretty important to people out in the community. 
this was how we learned about when the war ended, when war started and stuff like that. Uh, and because we didn't have out in the country, we didn't have newspaper delivery either. And I, to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure that I knew about the, a newspaper until I was, you know, seven or eight years old. We didn't, nobody I knew took the newspaper. We did take a little magazine. And the older people out there my age will uh, remember a magazine called The Grit. But at any rate, my aunt and her husband were late getting in their co cotton crop. So they needed help to pick in cotton. And so we went and helped them pick cotton and they paid us in a radio that didn't have a battery. So we some, somehow the, my mother found out a place which was about a mile and a half from our house that had a battery for sale. So she wanted to be sure it was a uh, correct battery. So she uh, borrowed my grandmother's, my step-grandmother's wagon and her mules and uh, to go over to pick up the battery. Well, after about a mile, we approached the highway. And just as we turned on the highway, a train came along and uh, the, uh, the horses ran away. But I tell you, my mother was strong enough and, and everything. We ran down in the ditch and kept running along, but she kept the wagon from, from turning over. None of us got hurt, although I think she should have backhanded my sister and myself because we were screaming and carrying on like wild, wild people. Uh, but anyway, it was the most interesting experience and certainly one that made our day in a way. Now, since I've been down here, you know, I've had the uh, good fortune of knowing Sybil since I was 19 years old, which was just a few years ago, I'm sure all of you are thinking. But it's been amazing to me how often people have stopped by to say hello and just chat with you and check in with you and are obviously very inspired by you. So who inspires you? Well, I think, and I wish that he was still, he and she were still alive. Of course, my mother has inspired me greatly. Uh, she always felt like you could do anything that you put your mind to doing. And if it was the right thing anyway, if it was the wrong thing, she had other opinions about that, which were very strong too. But I think that I had a high school teacher, a man, he taught me math, but he taught some other courses. And I went to a very small, small school. And as a matter of fact, I graduated from um, a, a class of 13. Now the classes after that were bigger and the part of it had to do, many of the boys in my class dropped out and went to service. Things were bad um, at that time too, uh, financially in the area that I lived in. Uh, but uh, I just... Uh, so the high school man was your teacher was very one, inspirational. Yes, he was one, and also my home high school home economics teacher was very, very instrumental. Both of them are deceased, but one of them is Leo Russian and one of them was Mr. Woods. And I would like for their families to know how much I appreciate them. What was so inspiring about them? Well, uh, Mr. Woods, uh, he just, he just seemed to like our class as a whole. Mm -hmm. My my sister had him for a teacher two or three years later, and quite frankly, most of them couldn't stand him. But he seemed to just jihaw with our class. Ms. Russian was one of these kind of people. Uh, for example, if a, if a girl got in trouble become, by becoming pregnant or some problem like that, she was there realizing that well, what was happening, and she was there right in their lives, helping them every way she could. She also had some, would sort of look after children who were neglected and who were sexually and physically abused, uh, which was beyond her realm of teaching. So she, she was just generally uh, a good all-around teacher and a community uh, helper. I can see how that has influenced you because I've known you for so long and I've seen how you've always had an ear for someone. If someone was wanted to talk or just was upset, you'd always be there for them. And I think that that's a, a very strong quality that you have. And one thing I've always been curious about was how did you 
when I first met you, I was 19 and a lot of people your age wouldn't have responded as positively as you did being in a dorm full of mainly teenagers, 18 to 22. So you're different in that way. So what about you made you say to everyone, hey, I'm here if you need a problem? Well, mainly I told them right up front when they looked up and you could see, oh, we're going to have that old woman in the dorm. And they, that is true. They, they do. You can, uh, cause I've had it, them say the things I think they said about me, but about other people. And I worked nearly 20 years and lived in that dorm that much. So uh, I became somewhat of a fixture, but I always told them right up front. I let them know I was not their mother. I was not their father. And I didn't take them to rear if I could help them in any way, because a lot of those uh, young people didn't have cars and I was there with my car. You know, if I needed, they needed to be taken somewhere uh, or if they needed any help in other ways, I helped them. And I did get called on a lot, which to be perfectly honest, made me feel good. So I think sometimes we have to remember that when we do things for people that we get as much good out of it as that person does. As a matter of fact, I think I get more good out of it. I would agree with that. Uh, I am a huge fan of paying it forward. And I had something happen at Christmas where I brought some groceries for a woman. They denied her WIC card. And she was so grateful and so thankful and acted like I had done her huge, some huge favor. But I felt she got the short end of the stick because it made me feel so good. So I absolutely, absolutely believe that. What would you say you have led such an incredible life, but if you were to think about some of your favorite memories or your greatest memories, what would those be? Well, I'm gonna tell you, I don't know if these are the best or favorite memories, but uh, I wanna tell you a little bit about what we did for fun. Remember, we didn't always have the radio. Uh, as a matter of fact, we were quite up, I was quite up 11 or 12 years old before we had the radio and didn't have a newspaper and didn't have electricity. But this is some of the things that we did for pleasure or fun. Well, one of the things we would uh, make straw houses, which we would take the pine straw and uh, rake it up and we'd make couches and beds and stoves and then we'd make the, uh, uh, just a regular house to play in like playing house. And another thing is we got older in which we could go down to the woods and pull down the bigger pine trees. And then we would ride them like up and down and up and down. You had to get one exactly right or it would bend over too far. Uh, if it was too uh, strong, it was sort of, if you got bent down too far enough to, to get on it to go up and down, well, it would pitch you off and everything. The other thing that we did, which I cannot believe, we would uh, chunk wasp nest. I remember one time on Sunday, I chunked a wasp nest and I got five or six stings on my face. Now, you know, we must have really been acclimated to, uh, to their, that sort of thing, to the outside, I'm saying, the outside atmosphere, because although it swelled up a little bit, I didn't have to see a doctor. We wouldn't have known to see a doctor anyway. We didn't have a way to go see the doctor. Uh, so um, that's, that's not some of the things that are memorable to me. Uh, I think my greatest thing has been being able to travel over most of the world. And I traveled by uh, seeing it in a very uh, basic, very basic, basic way. Sometimes it was camping out, uh, you know, I, in the uh, desert and uh, out from Egypt, I camped out and with a bed with a bed once overnight. And uh, I would say that it was the most beautiful night I've ever seen. The stars uh, were just out of this world. You cannot imagine what it's like uh, to see the heavens without there being electric lights or, or anything like that. It was just beautiful. Uh, we, uh, uh, I have gone hot air ballooning, uh, which I think it's just like being near heaven. Uh, it, it couldn't be anything closer to heaven than that. It's such a such a soft feeling. So so it just inspires you. In uh, your garage, you have maps 
of everywhere and you have push pins, I believe, in every place that you've traveled. Do you know how many countries you've traveled to? No, no, I'm sorry. sorry. I never have counted them. Well, you, you've been to, let's see, Mongolia. Yeah. Uh, Siberia. Siberia. I don't know Russia, many people. Russia. Russia uh, Peru, Egypt, I know. Egypt. Egypt. Um, and uh, Israel. And, and Israel. And most all of the European countries. And most all the Scandinavian countries. And then you've traveled to... All the... Were, all the states all the states most of the, most of the provinces in canada and also uh i have uh gone to spanish school in guatemala for four weeks and really uh i didn't learn learn any spanish i'm sorry to say uh but we made outdoor latrines and uh stoves in them that you make in the corner of their uh little houses and the reason that stoves were made was because there's a certain way that you can eliminate the smoke, which prevents the newborn babes who are mainly kept in that room, in the room where the kitchen is. They kept there the first six weeks. So they, uh, so we made a stove that was uh, ventilated a certain way in which the smoke could go outside. You have to understand that Guatemala is a very, very deprived country. I mean, the children, the children are running around going through garbage piles all the time. Their street children start as young as four years old. Uh, and so uh, I have to do that. And the uh, and I can't explain to you how basic the uh, tools were that we worked with. I mean, we had one, uh, one hoe and one shovel. We used, uh, when we made the outdoor latrines, we used uh, uh, old motor, motor oil, which had been drained off when they changed it and kept, uh, changed it to uh, new motor oil in the cars. That's what we swabbed out the uh, things that you put the concrete in, the mold. Uh, and that, that must have had a great impact on uh, on the people that you helped. Uh, I hope, I hope it uh, did and everything, but uh, I'm not, I'm not sure uh, about it. Uh, I, I mean, uh, what would happen, the people that want, got the outdoor latrines, they would come and pick them up. So I never just see see anybody that got one. We have a good question for you on chat. What is the one change in our world that left the most impact on you up to now? Could you repeat the question? It's what is the one change in our world that left the most impact on you up until now? Oh, I can assure you it's the computer. I can, can no way in the world capture it or control it or any way uh, get ahead of it or even with it. I mean, it's really just still a real boogaboo to me. Uh, but uh, I suppose what I really like most, I enjoy the television. So I think that would be uh, for a pers from a personal standpoint. I think that would be what I enjoy, enjoy the most, you know. Uh, and uh, I just think we should think about when we, when and where we're going to war. And remember, part of my thing is love. And I think if you love somebody enough, we won't be going to war so much. Now, you know, you've had great adventures in your life and probably more so than anyone I've ever known. Although I joke with you, my five-year-old nephew, Max, is going to give you a good run for your money because he loves life just as much as you do. What advice would you give to someone who maybe is just fearful? It doesn't matter if it's afraid of leaving their home or taking a plane ride or maybe traveling to another country. I mean, I think fear stops so many people from doing things. So what would you do to encourage someone to get over a fear? Well, first and foremost, you need, unless you're, unless you're planning a trip, uh, to out of the world, which uh, I, I've never planned a trip out of the world, you know. I did want to go up so badly uh, when the, the, uh, the teacher uh, um, got killed in one of our space explorations. Uh, I did want to do that, so I don't know how I would have prepared for it, but I would have been up for it. I think you need to tell yourself first, I'm here on Earth. Whatever you're doing, you basically here on Earth. Now you say that's not true. If I take the plane ride and everything, yeah, you're still here on Earth. 
And the next thing, take, take it in small little steps like the movie Baby Steps, you know. Uh, you know, maybe you want to never flown in an airplane. Take a short trip. Go, go to an airport first. Go and look at an uh, airplane and uh, see what it's like. Uh, talk to other people. Uh, then if you, think, if you think that you really want to do that, then you're going to do it. If it really wasn't, if you really are just been giving it uh, tongue value, just talking about it and talking it up and talking it up until you think you do, well, then you just need to take that off your slate because uh, you really need to want to want to do whatever it is. Uh, want's a big thing. I agree with that. So how do you want people to remember you, Sybil? Oh. Uh, that's that's such a hard question. I I uh, I I want them to remember me that that I was always willing to help and everything. And I did participate in some things that I am going to mention, not because I'm trying to promote myself because I have nothing to promote. I'm sure that you know from the other session that I had uh, that I do have advanced cancer. I am in stage four, and it's uh, it's really a miracle that I continue to live. But I participate in some very good uh, organizations. I uh, I've worked or volunteered in a hospice for AIDS victims, uh, and I did that in the nineties. I want you to tell me. I want you to expand on that because I remember you telling me stories. We've known each other since uh 1988 and you were one of the first people i knew because still at that time when you were volunteering in the in the aids hospice aids was still fairly new i mean we had some ideas about it but people were still afraid to touch people with aids they didn't want to use a toilet that someone with aids had and you know you're really pioneering in that field so what one why did you do that and what allowed you because there are today people who believe that those that have AIDS are it's a curse from God. So what allowed you to do that? Well, really what really prompted me to do it is because the lack of people participating as a volunteer in that field. They just didn't have any, anybody just speak for them more or less. And uh, I, I just felt like it just, I just felt like I was called to uh, help uh, this, I drove uh, 55 miles, uh, I'm sorry, I drove 70 miles to uh, once a week for a couple of years. Uh, I didn't quit for any per particular reason, Thing, other things happened in my life. Uh, but uh, during the time I did I help, uh, I volunteered in the uh, AIDS uh, hospice, uh, people did think I was, I, I had people tell me I was crazy. And I, I had a feeling they'd try not to touch me too. But I mean, they never said that, but I always felt like from the way they drew back sometime when it came up, that they were fearful of, catch, of catching the AIDS. Uh, but I had some very interesting experiences working with them. And they, uh, uh, I remember one that I, I just felt so good about. They were all, uh, in uh, the uh, living room, looking at uh, these beautiful women that were going across the stage. Oh gosh, they were gorgeous, beautiful. And so I said, "Excuse me, what are y'all watching?" And uh, uh, so they said to one person, uh, he, "They go, you that's that's your uh, problem, that's your situation. You have to tell her." And he said, he pointed up and he said. Oh, that's me right there, and they were so they were, he was dressed so pretty in a gown and had his makeup on and everything, uh, you know, in the in the person of a woman, you know. And I said to him, "You look so pretty," and I never will forget uh, how pleased I was uh, that he uh, he uh, was pleased that I told him how pretty he looked uh, and everything. And that's one of the things I meant about acceptance. You know, uh, the fact that uh, he he had AIDS, but uh, he had gone through the stage that he had dressed in what he wanted to. 
and and I went ahead and, and only but not only that, but I extended it to letting him know that I accepted uh, his position in life. And uh, we did have some to die while I was there, and uh, I had corresponded with a number of them until most of them that I knew had passed away. They now have a very beautiful home. It's an antebellum home in Shreveport, and people, each person has their own uh, room, and it's just a, a wonderful situation. But there are other things out there. Uh, uh, Habitat for Humanity. I volunteered. Uh, I actually went on location for a month and volunteers for Humanity. That is a wonderful. What I'm trying to say, there are wonderful programs out there. Sometimes you can volunteer on them, just do something at home, especially how... Uh, the habitat one, you can, there's many things that you can do uh, in working with them. I did go on location uh, for a month uh, with them, uh, and uh, I was, uh, was offered, which I felt was a real, uh, I felt real good about it at any rate, uh, they asked me if I would come and paint on a uh, the job they would every once in a while they would do a job and they planned it out exactly and they would do a house completely to get to move into in a week and uh, so but unfortunately I was going back to the park to work uh, and did not get to participate in that endeavor. Ready to change your life? Are you ready to release all of your clutter physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual? Our new Declutter Your Life video series is a how-to, go-at-your-own-pace course to guide you through the process of clearing clutter. The course includes all of our popular How to Get Organized classes. Learn more at reawakenyourbrilliance.com. I want to go back to a second um, because, one, this is a central philosophy and, and values that you live by. What do you think it is about you that allows you to have such an accepting heart and such love. Because again, for instance, you were volunteering in the AIDS home at a time when, when people shun those that had AIDS. You know, you mentioned a man dressing up as a woman. I mean, gender issues are still uh, seen as a very negative and wrong and evil by so many people. So what is it about you that makes you so loving and accepting? Did you have a, maybe a particular instance in your life where you weren't accepted and that that maybe drove you to be this way? What do you think it is? Well, I don't, I can't think of any instance that, that, that occurred. I uh, was able to retire when I was 53 and a half. I started working in the night, some night in national parks, um, as a summertime job and traveling a lot, but I felt that it was not right for me to devote, not to devote part of my life to volunteering. For, it's just not right. So I just, I didn't, I just felt the need of, uh, for me that I couldn't go out there uh, making money, then gallivanting around. Uh, uh, that's what I, why I did it. Up, then about a month and a month and a half, I would go on a trip. And true enough, it, went, it were not expensive trips, but there were trips. And I did not think it was right to be sitting around the rest of the time. And it wasn't right for me not to give back to society. I, I think everybody should give a certain amount of time back to society. If they look, if they look around, they can find, they can find a, a need for, I think what people want to do, they want a high profile position, uh, let's say they had a, a fairly high profile position. So then when they change that over to doing volunteer work, they don't think about that they're not going to get that high, that, that high position. They need to think about doing the little menial things that maybe some other people don't do. Those things have to be done too. And, uh, and believe you me, that's what we did when I did Habitat for Humanity. And that's what I did when I was in the hospice thing. I went to the grocery store farm. I cooked. Uh, I took them to the doctor. Uh, I didn't have a job of setting up a, a program farm. I didn't have a high position. And when I did the habitat thing, I painted. I had paint in a month. 
I helped paint three houses, uh, not outside, but all inside. I have volunteered for Habitat for Humanity, and I think that that's a wonderful cause. They have the people who are going to be the recipients of the home join in as well, and it's really fantastic. Looking back on your life, do you have any regrets? Is there anything you do differently or you're pretty much happy with the way things went? Well, on a general level, I think I used to be too uptight about protocol. You know, if somebody got a little bit out of, uh, yeah, I can't even think of an example right now, but let's say they didn't exactly fall in. Maybe their grammar wasn't too good. Lately, it seems my grammar hasn't been too good either. But their grammar wasn't good. And I would, you know, I would think in my mind, oh, that person should keep their mouth shut. If they can't talk talk right, they should keep their mouth shut. So uh, I, I think, you know, I was sort of stiff and uh, unaccepting. And I think that that I've had to, I have had to work on acceptance too. We all have to work on it. I still have to work on acceptance. Uh, love is a lot easier to work on than acceptance. If you just think about it, you, you can say, oh, well, I can love that person. And maybe you do love that person, but maybe you don't really have to put that love to task either. You may not have to ever prove it. But I think acceptance, you more or less have to stand by what you really believe and say um, I think that's wonderful and I also want to switch gears for a minute because if your building latrines in Guatemala wasn't enough sleeping out in the desert in the stars wasn't enough you are also and I don't know if everyone knows this about you a published author so I want you to tell us about the book you wrote well yes well it's, I, I wrote it with my sister and it was my sister's eye to begin with uh, it's uh, 84 and still practicing. It, he is now deceased, but at the time, uh, it was our doctor, our local doctor in the in the Shelby County in Texas, and he was still practicing at 84. And we did a book uh, about him, which unfortunately didn't turn out to be a bestseller. But I love the book anyway, and uh, so that was really. Uh, Really enjoyed that, and my high school girlfriend and I have written a romance novel together. We have not successfully been able to uh, get it published yet, but we can always hope and try uh, and everything. Uh, and we will get that published, and when that is published, we will be sure to let you know so all of you can buy a copy, because I have no doubt that it's going to be entertaining, especially as I know Sybil so well. So I also want you to talk, another great passion of your life has been bridge. And I have had the good fortune of visiting what I call the Steel Magnolias Bridge Club. Because I have to tell you, Steel Magnolias, for those of you who don't know, was based here in Natchitoches. If you watch the film, Steel Magnolias, uh, it's some of it's filmed in Natchitoches. And Sybil actually went to the funeral of the real girl that died. But the Bridge Club has been one of the greatest joys that I've uh, been able to be a part of when I'm here, but I want you to talk to me a little bit about that. What I'm amazed is at the friendships of this group. Not only do they care about you, they care about each other. The entire time I've been here, the phone has been off the hook with people seeing how you're doing. So just talk to me a little bit about that group. Well, of course, I like to talk about Bridge anyway, and uh, I was fortunate enough uh, at one point, I didn't think I would get my life masters. Now, if you're not into the bridge world, you won't understand that. But people belong to, uh, it's called the ACBL, American Bridge Association. And you are you play in a club, which, you know, you can ask some friend about exactly how it works. But I got my, was able to get my life masters, which meant I got 300 points of various in various uh, areas attending national and local and uh, regional events. And uh, then I got my bronze, which meant I got 200 more points. Uh, and it just keeps going up. It's uh, it's sort of like, uh, well, it helps to keep your mind uh, more alert. That's one reason I work crossword puzzles. That's the two things I try to, to do is uh, keep my mind as alert as, alert as possible. And so uh, 
but what the bridge does it draws people to together and they just have they have this thing that they're going to look after each other it's a it's a wonderful wonderful uh way to have friends and to have friends who look after you and care about you uh so i i, su I suggest whether you do bridge or not that you have some fun aim in life that is pair, pair, uh, would be ongoing now what advice would you give to someone i mean there was a famous book out there on how to make friends but someone out there might be shy and and i know a lot of people struggle socially what advice would you give to someone on how they could be a good friend or to get more friends well to be a, to get friends you have to be a good friend and, and it, it doesn't have to be big things. People seem to think that everything has to come in a bow tie package. We, things don't have to come in a bow tie package. You're in the elevator and, there, and there's the ugliest person there that you've ever seen. And she is just beyond uh, redemption as far as looks and everything. And she has a pretty pin on. Or maybe uh, her earrings are pretty. It never hurts to give a person a truly meant compliment and so i just think that if you if you are attuned to other people then you are going to be a friend i think that's great and i think all the ugly people of the world won't have to worry when they run into you that you won't call them out on that so i think that's a good thing I'm funning with you, Sybil. Okay. Gotta give you a little fun here. We have to have our humor. Yeah. I also want you to talk about, I had the privilege, I've been down here for about a week doing your weekly prayer group that you do. And again, I was just uh, so humbled by the wonderful women there and and how they cared about you and that just their nurturing of everyone. Tell us a little bit about that. And if you want to talk about your faith, you don't have to, but how that influence has been in your life. You're about the prayer group or Christianity, whatever you're comfortable with. Well, you know, uh, I am, I am Christian and uh, I don't have any uh, other uh, beefs or call outs with other religion. Uh, they have their own, their own things. Uh, I, that is, it's really not my prayer group. I was, I was fortunate enough. This is a, a woman's prayer group mainly is uh, Methodist. Uh, I am Baptist, but it's anybody can anybody's welcome. But they invited me when it, my time of need uh, has become uh, more uh, more in a crucial way. You know, uh, my time is very very limited, and they asked me, and they have been such a supporters, and they have promised me. That when I am dying, they will go around, sing, get, stand around my bed and sing uh, old uh, songs, that, uh, Christian songs that I like and everything. Uh, they just so soothing and uh, uh, they're all wonderful to me. And I hope that I'm wonderful to them because they're certainly a great pet. And uh, it just just makes you feel good. Well, I want to talk a little bit about that. As I've mentioned, I've known Sybil for 20 plus years and she really is a walking miracle because you've, you've, have you been in stage four for nine years? Is no, that what I've it been is? in stage four for seven years. But you've been in stage four for seven mm -hmm. years and, and not many people live that long in stage four, do they? That's correct. You know, they, my doctors call me a miracle. My they goodness. don't, still don't know why I'm alive. Uh, uh, in uh, July, was he told me in January of last year, not this year, last year my doc, my cancer doctor called, told me I would probably live uh, six months. When I lived six months, he just said he didn't know quite what to do with me, <laughs> that he'd only live, had a patient, his patient, with my medication I was taking, I had only lived 11 months. So when I got past the 11 months, which has been two months ago, he just says, you know, keep on doing what you're doing and uh, don't give up and be positive and I don't know what to do with you. What do you think your legacy is or what would you like your legacy to be? Like when you've passed, how do you want people to remember you? How do you think they'll remember you? 
I don't have to doubt how people will, will remember me. But I, I hope they will remember me that I, I consider myself a true friend to them. That's the way I'd like to be remembered. And, and I'd like for them to know that I love all of them. Why do you think it is that you are so courageous? I mean, I have to say I'm a little bit biased, but you, you truly are one of the most courageous women, and not even of women, people, pe persons that I've ever met. What do you, why is that? What do you think is? Well, I maintain that we're all humans and we're all here on the earth together. And if I get uh, uh, thrown off in the backwoods of the Amazon, and I don't, and I do know about the backwoods of the Amazon, that, that I'm going to be looked after by somebody. I don't think that somebody's going to shoot me or error me or anything like that. So I just think we are here on earth together and there's somebody that's going to, to look after me and take care of me. They've done it so far. Talk to me a little bit about, you told me the story and I can't remember if this was when you were at the hotel on the Black Sea, which ended up being a tent or if it was with the, in the desert with the Bowdens that you've always felt protected by God. Yes. Talk about that. I have spent a lot of time with God when I have been in these positions that I have put myself in sometime, particularly the, when uh, I was on the Black Sea and when they showed us our room, it was a tent and it didn't have a lock on it. And it just had two pads in there. And for our life, they handed us a candle and a box of matches. And uh, when I was uh, in the Amazon and way up in the Amazon, when we were going through walking and there were different animals and insects that I didn't know, uh, believe you me, uh, God has uh, had a hard time keeping up with me, but he's been there every step of the way. And, and for him, uh, that, that's been a, a real task, I can tell you. Uh, but I thank him from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I hope that all of you have a greater being in your life. I agree with you with that. I think, um, I know the atheists have been make, making the news a lot lately and I think, again, to each his own, but that just, for me personally, kind of makes me sad that you think that's it when you die, or there's, there's nothing greater than yourself not having that to believe in. And we have a question from chat. When the time comes, what are you planning on taking with you to the other side? My soul. Your soul, there you go. That's, I'm sorry, that's all, that's all God is going to require. It's just my soul. And that will be all I will be taking. That'll be all that I need. And I, I uh, really, uh, some days I really pray to die when I'm in great pain. Uh, but, uh, and, and look forward to dying. But to, today's not one of those. I'm not packing my bags today. Uh, I feel pretty, uh, fairly good today. I have to ask you this, you know, Sybil, in, in our Western society, talking about death is very taboo, but you are obviously comforted or comfortable talking about death. Why is that? Well, uh, I had a very uh, good experience with a sort of a pre-death experience and it just sort of, just sort of paved the way uh, for uh, me. I, at least that's the way I felt that it, uh, that it did. And so uh, I, I would like to say to anyone that does want to communicate with me about that what needs to talk about death is fearful of it and they think that talking with someone, uh, I do have a, um, a email, uh, symbol r11 at yahoo.com. I'd, you know, I'd be glad to uh, communicate with someone if they felt that, that, that I could be helpful uh, and everything. I think that's a very wonderful and generous offer so I'd like to ask, you know, so a lot of people who watch the show uh, might be going through a difficult time. They might be going through divorce. They might have lost their job and just really struggling right now. And I have to say, you are someone, you know, my advice is to be a civil or find a civil because you are someone through my entire life that I felt one believed in me, but I really felt, wow, if I got in trouble, you were someone that I could talk to and I could talk to you, frankly, there'd never be any judgment, but what advice would you give to someone that is out there struggling right now? Well, I think you have to find your, 
bigger being, if you don't already have a bigger being. And in my case, it's God. Uh, if you have a bigger being, then you need to call on them. You need to look around and see what your resources are. Is, is one of your resources not really a resource? Maybe you ought to rethink your resources. And then you need to think about who is really your resource uh, and what can they do or not do for you. Uh, and I, uh, I spend, a, I spend a, a lot of time praying. Uh, but my prayers are not usually asking. My prayers are usually thanking God for Because look, I'm not in a nursing home. Uh, I am semi housebound, but I am uh, able to get around. Uh, I'm able to have friends in. I just last week I had, uh, with the help of somebody, I could not do it with myself. I had uh, friends to come and spend time with me. I, we had four small dinner parties uh, for friends. And I'm just saying that you need to look around and see who can help you, who maybe is not helping you that think they might be helping you. And you need to send a lot, a lot of prayer with your greater being, which in my case is, is God. Now, can you share with us, I've known this story about you, but I think you had a really beautiful story when um, not too long ago you thought might have, your time might have been up, um, but you had a very interesting experience in the hospital. What was that? Well, that was sort of my near-death experience. Oh, I was in the hospital with pneumonia, and the doctor had already come by at one point and told me, well, he was having some trouble getting responses from me. And so he said, well, you know, you're dying, don't you? Which at the time I didn't know I was dying. And, uh, but I had to lean, uh, the only way I could be comfortable, I had to lean across the little table that they rolled around and put stuff on where I put pills on it. And so out of, the, out of this wall in front of me came these huge, they were like four or five feet tall, uh, birds and they I don't know what they were but they were dark and black and they were not heavy or anything they just lightly lit on my my shoulder and about that time out of the out of the wall came this beautiful beautiful iridescent smoke it was orange and pinks and purple well not purple blues and it was just beautiful and I thought you know this is where God is coming out to get me and I felt real comforted by it it was not uncomfortable. It was very comforting. And I was so somewhat a little taken back when the smoke just recessed itself, just gradually recessed itself. And there I was in the hospital room again. However, it must not have been my time to go. Well, we hope that you're still with us a little bit longer. I know, again, just having known you for so long and seeing the outpouring of love while I've been here, it's truly, I, I hope to have the same uh, at the end of my life or right now, I, I think I'm, I'm pretty blessed there with friends, but I think it's really important. So is there anything else that you'd want people to know about your, what's something maybe that you've never shared with anyone? Is there something that even your best bridge club friends wouldn't know about you? Oh, uh, no, uh, there might be things that I probably hadn't shared with them, but I probably wouldn't share it. <laughs> I'm sorry. What? You're not going to do it for everyone in the world no, to see? I don't believe I am uh, and everything. I could I could tell about my most embarrassing moment. Do you want to share that? I don't know that people want to hear it. But yeah, uh, we, when I was in the first grade, well, my mother made our little underpanties out of sugar sacks. Sugar used to come in cloth sacks. Well, you know, uh, it just had one a uh, piece of elastic around the top. Well, the the uh, water system, we would turn on a faucet, and uh, like at the end of a hose, but it wasn't at the end of the hose. It was those faucets. We would go outside, and we would turn those on, and we would drink. Well, that, that went off, and so uh, we had to draw water. They had to draw water, and they would lean it forward for you to, the bucket. They would pull it up in a bucket, and they'd lean it forward, and you would drink. Well, in the meantime, the elastic had broken in my panties, and I was holding up each side of them with my hand. Well, six years old, you tend to forget things. So when they leaned the bucket forward to me, instead of using one hand, I turned loose, and my panties dropped around my ankle. And I never will forget to this day how their children, especially those little boys, laughed at me. And it, and, uh, it was a really 
a most embarrassing experience in my life. Oh my goodness. Well, you know what? I would just say to them, if they could see you now, because you have led an exemplary life and have influenced many people and uh, but I can understand how embarrassing that would be. So I have another question for well, you. Well, I want to just comment okay. a little farther on that. I think that that story and when I have repeated it before has caused many lives for people. And that's what the world is about is being, if you can life, then you're okay. okay. So I hope all of you laughed about it because it's not intended to be, oh, you poor little thing. It was not like that at all. I mean, it, yes, it was that at the time, but so many people have enjoyed and got have gotten a life out of it. I don't think I'll ever look at a sack of the sugar the same again. Well, now the sugar was in a cloth sack. Was okay. in a cloth sack. Well, I'm not going to look at cloth sacks <laughs> the same anymore either. I've seen sacks like that before. <laughs> okay. So okay. another thing that's really important to me, I do this show because I want people to live their best life, to be authentic, to be who they are. So what step would you take? What one thing could people do to reawaken their brilliance? And I simply mean by that, what step, one step advice would you give? Be more authentic, to be more happy. What one thing could they do? What could they do to take action? Well, I, I think that uh, the lady you had on uh, a, few day, a, few, a few weeks ago, uh, she said, you know, look and say to somebody, well, you're just saying this to yourself, but you look and say, I love you. And then you also reinforce yourself and you say, I love me too. Or you say, I love me. I think that was sort of part of her message but that I found that would be good for a person. And it doesn't cost a dime. That's, That's something, you know, again, that we always have a choice. I believe that. And, and how important it is. And Sybil, we have another um, comment for you on chat. Like Mike said, which would have been your interview um, with Marilyn on Breaking Free, they want to book you for a show same time next year. Oh, well, <laughs> I am glad you're optimistic. I, I'm, I'm going to take you up on that. Well, it is, it is my hope that I'm going to be doing this interview with you again, that I come down to Natchitoches in the fall and that we have a chance to have more conversation with you because I think the world is a better place with you in it. Um, I'm a little selfish. I want you to stick around, but I'm not in charge of that. So I just, I want to say this for the world. You've been such a wonderful influence on my life. And I, and I want to tell Julie, she's been a wonderful influence in my life. And let me tell you, she's taken care of me all week. I mean, royally taken care of me. And it's just been so nice to have her. It, friends are, are just the best commodity on this earth. You cannot have too many of them. And I tell you, I love all of mine. And, uh, and all of mine, I feel it. I feel their love. I don't, don't have to be told. I feel it. I know when they, they love me. And uh, that's such a good feeling. It's such a, such a good feeling. And I want you to, to love your friends and let them know you love them. Uh, and uh, Julie, I love you. And I love you. And I did a really good job. I only got emotional at the end, but I think this is a good place to end the interview. We will be broadcasting this for the world to see. Um, and we want my goal is that we have thousands of people watching this show because you have been such an influence on my life and others. And they can see how you started off in challenging circumstances, but you've made something wonderful in your life. So we're going to end it here in Natchitoches. And I say bye now and Sybil sign off for us. Good day. May you, all of you have good lives. Thanks. Bye now. Go out, clear the clutter to create the life you choose, deserve, and desire. Thanks for listening to Clearing the Clutter Inside and Out. Sign up for our newsletter and receive a free copy of our 10 clutter-free living tips. Ready to create the life you choose, deserve, and desire? Learn about Julie's services including coaching, classes, affirmations, aromatherapy, and her unique How to Declutter Your Life course and more at reawakenyourbrilliance.com. 
don't forget to subscribe and join us next Tuesday at 1 p.m. Remember, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step.